Thank you, Zoom lady, appreciate you. We are gonna be recording so that I can look back and learn how to continue to do my best possible job for y'all. But like I said, we're not recording the chat. So use that chat to stay engaged, plus one each other, thoughts, feels, reactions, additional questions, all of that good stuff. But since I'm having y'all show up in chat, reminder, what happens in the Zoom room stays in the Zoom room. If you wanna text, tweet, call your grandma, shout it from the rooftops about your experience, Go for it. Just make sure you're talking about your experience and nobody else's. So enough about me. I want to get a sense from you all. This is what we call our resting heart rate. So take a moment to locate yourself if it helps to take a breath and enter one word to describe how you're feeling right here, right now in chat. No explanation needed. You can be excited, you can be curious, you can be tired, you can be hungover, don't worry, I won't tell, you can be aware, you can be content, right on Sebastian, energized, nervous, Laura, busy, yes, that is totally fair, it gives me the opportunity to get a sense of where this group is at tonight, but also for you all to get a sense of where you are and where this community is, that you're here with, oh, we're interested and procrastinating, Hunter, no worries, and tired and satisfied. I love it, y'all. One of the other ways I like to warm us up before we dive all the way in is just to get a general poll. You're going to see a poll launch here, and I want to get a sense from the folks in this room right now how confident you're feeling in your communication skills with your partner. On a scale of one, we really struggle to communicate in general, to five, we can talk through anything and everything that comes our way. So let's take a moment, answer that poll question. Important note, your response is totally anonymous. I don't see who answers what. So we'll give y'all, let's take another hot 10 seconds for this. I'm gonna take a sip of my water and we'll let these, we'll let these come on in here. Okay, they are coming in. Interesting. Okay, let's go. Five, four, three, two, and one. So check this out. A good chunk of us in this room, about 45% of us, we're, we're neutral. We're somewhere in the middle. Some topics are easier to talk through than others. Some of us are in the ones and twos and some of us are in the fours and fives. Really what this lets us know, what it lets me know, is we've all got a little bit of work to do when it comes to how we're showing up in partnership and how we're communicating. We got a lot of questions to this topic, y'all. So I want you to keep your eyes, your eyes, these are not your eyes, your eyes and ears peeled for your question within a theme. We grouped questions by theme. So the themes that you're going to hear about today are setting healthy boundaries, being true to yourself in partnership, really understanding arguments and what the heck they're about anyway, being able to successfully navigate disagreements, and then of course being flexible and open to compromise. So with that, Pallavi, will you start us off with our first question? Yes, Jamie, how is communication different when it comes to romantic relationships versus like a work relationship or something less romantic or platonic? Yeah, has anyone ever noticed in your plus one in chat if something about relationship communication just feels different? So I want to start with the ways in which actually communication is similar across relationships. So all those ships that I talked about a second ago, friendship, co-workership, family ship, partnership, all interpersonal relationships, they do include a few different communication styles. So there is verbal communications, all the things that we actually with our voice box vocalize. There are nonverbal, so the things that we say through our body language, through our facial expressions. There's written communication, the things we write down. There is listening as a part of communication. Yes, actually taking into the stuff, receiving what we're hearing. That is part of communication, more on that later. And then, of course, visual. So the things that we might communicate through showing someone. Out of curiosity, in chat, let me know which of these five feels the hardest for you when it comes to communication flavors or styles? Is it the verbal? Is it the lis listening, which is a-okay? Maybe it's the written. Knowing that there are all different 
avenues of communication. Yeah, verbal or visual, that's fair. Knowing that there's all different avenues for it, we wanna check in with ourselves. So communication in relationships, it's always been extra tough to navigate for anyone, any age, any time period. Why is that? Well, the biggest difference in romantic partnership compared to maybe some of our other relationships is the intimacy factor. And I don't just mean sexual intimacy. I mean, the type of closeness that we cultivate with someone who's a romantic partner, when we establish this type of closeness, this type of intimacy, familiar feelings from our first ever close relationships can get stirred up. And when I mean our first ever relationships, I'm not talking about your middle school crush. I'm actually talking about the relationship that you had with your parents or your caregivers, whoever raised you. These are really, truly our first ever experience of close relationships. And as the first ones, they laid a lot of the groundwork for our understanding of how relationship with other people is supposed to go. That means all of our relationships are influenced by what I call our relational blueprint. So knowing that this blueprint impacts our present day relationship, it's really important to make a pit stop at our blueprints to check in on what foundations were even established for us. So take a moment to think about what was modeled for you in romantic partnership communication or what you experienced in communication with your parents or caregivers. Just, just think about that in your brain box. What are some of the messages that you got about how to be in communication, right? These are just four examples. This is not an exhaustive list. Maybe we got the message of, you know, don't try to change your partner. It's impossible. Maybe we witnessed that you really have to be willing to compromise or you should always be on the same page as your partner. Or if they don't hear you, you gotta turn the volume up and just get louder and get more in their face. Feel free to share and chat which of these four shows up for you. Oh, yeah, Pallavi, don't get go to bed angry. That is definitely messaging that we can have in our blueprint. So knowing that some of these messages might be ones that you hold as really valuable, while other ones maybe you want to start challenging and changing now that you're a grown-ass adult human recognizing communication needs for your relationship, it means returning to those earlier messages to either hold on to them as a really strong foundation, for example, the willingness to compromise, or removing the messages that are old and rotting and renovating with something that better suits your present self. For example, disagreements, they don't have to be relationship ending. Maybe I want there to be a safe space for differences between myself and my partner. A very important note here, y'all, these processes of renovating from our original blueprints, they take time. So it is okay to feel disheartened or frustrated or unsure as you start to rework that original blueprint. This is literally what therapy is all about. In therapy, you're working with a trained professional to help you see, understand, reorganize that blueprint. So knowing that, let's keep us moving. Okay, how do I ask for the alone time I need as an introvert without hurting my extroverted partner who is isolated because of the pandemic? Ooh, we, was anyone else trapped in a small space with your partner? and having to figure out how to work it, or maybe, I don't know, maybe that was just me. I'm guessing I am not alone. This question really speaks to the emotional fitness trait of empathy. And while empathy, yes, is being able to feel what someone else is feeling, like our partners, and empathizing with that, it doesn't mean that we take it on as our responsibility to fix it or bend over backwards right? Really, we can both maintain an empathetic stance and express our needs simultaneously, right? If your needs go unmet, you'll end up in what I call a toaster fight. I'll tell you more about that one later. And you won't be able to support your partner at all. Ultimately, it's easier to prevent than to fix something in the moment. So the awesome Picasso 
said without great solitude, no serious work is possible. And at COA, we really firmly believe two things. First, that we all have our own individual work to be doing. And second, that that work does deepen and it solidifies when we practice it in community. So giving ourselves that gift of solitude, aka space and privacy, it really honors that first big belief. Taking time to yourself where that deep and important work can happen. And sometimes, y'all, the deep and important work is simply unplugging and resting, right? That's not, not important. Giving ourselves the opportunity to do that becomes integral because that's when we can show up as our best partnered selves and being more empathetic in that way. So what can this look like? It looks like creating space. There's a number of things that we can do solo and we can explicitly ask to do these things by ourselves. So something like listening to music, we might let our partners know, hey, when my headphones are on, like that's, that's me time. That's where I'm enjoying my jams. Reading or journaling, that might be something that you dive into alone. And so when your partner sees you with a book or a journal or pen in your hand, they know to give you some space. Taking a walk is something that we can do solo. Getting some air, literally, into your lungs and into your belly. Cultivating a breath practice is something that we might ask to do by ourselves. And lastly, really want to emphasize one of the ways I want to invite y'all to start thinking about creating space is to quite literally take it by choosing to get out of the house or, or away from your partner. We might not all live with our partners, but staying somewhere else, it gives you a very real opportunity to take space. So spending a night or two with family, with friends at an Airbnb or hotel. And I recognize that we might not all have access to this option. However, it might be one worth exploring and investing in to prioritize your mental health in this way. All right, what's this next one, Paulby? I can't. Is there such a thing as too much communication with a partner? Should we keep some things to ourselves? Oh, so this was a really juicy question for me because there is a big difference between cultivating your own rich inner world and withholding from your partner. Again, these are not the same thing. You can cultivate your own inner world and not be withholding. And usually this is where people start to worry. It's okay to not want to share all of the thoughts and all of the feels and all of the relationships and all of the experiences all of the times. Some things can be just for you. So this is actually related to that question we just had about asking for alone time. One thing that we do need to consider is whether or not we're getting caught up in all or nothing thinking, meaning in the sense that if I'm in a healthy partnership, I have to share all of what I think, feel, experience, or I'm going to share not a lot of what I think, feel, experience. For those of us who tend to become fixated on the all, we rarely balance it out with perspectives that, you know, open us up to a little bit more within the realm of what's realistic, right? You're seeing that gray space of reality. Or maybe for those of you who tend to lean into not sharing very much, that can also be similarly uncomfortable, right? These are the folks who maybe pivot away from sharing with more of a, it's okay, it's fine, I'm fine, it's all good right? When we get caught up in that all or nothing, it's usually because something is very uncomfortable for us about that gray area of reality. Because y'all, gray is messy and gray is unknowable, right? Living there can feel like pretty scary when we try to persuade ourselves of what is like the one ultimate truth. I should share this or I should not share this. Usually there's no such thing right? Neither one of those sides is totally realistic. Being really real bleh, words, being realistic, there it is, lets us start to tap into the resources that we do have at our disposal, right? Even if something about that gray realistic space is uncomfortable to us, 
like potentially not sharing everything with our partner or them not sharing everything with us. So author and couples therapist, Esther Perel, she writes that everyone should cultivate a secret garden. And as she describes it, personal intimacy is what demarcates a private zone. One that does require tolerance and respect. It's a space, physical, emotional, and intellectual that belongs only to me. So I want y'all to start to think about what might be in your garden. If we think about this physical, emotional, or intellectual space. So physical space just for you, this can look like nap time, bath time, movement in your body time. It can look like solo sex time, in other words, masturbation, or emotionally, your therapy can be a space just for you that your partner doesn't know everything you're talking about or enjoying certain music, certain shows, movies, other relationships. And I'm not just talking about other romantic relationships, even though all sorts of configurations and relationships is totally cool. I'm thinking about friendships and family and coworkers, other relationships that have an emotional stake that you can cultivate just for you. And in the intellectual realm, we can think about our careers, learning something new that we've always wanted to learn, just conversing with other people. This can be, you know, the barista, your favorite coffee shop down the store, or even problem solving solo, right? Being able to do or come up with or game plan something by yourself that you're not sharing with a partner, that can be something that's part of your secret garden. Go ahead and share in chat, what is one thing, be it physical, emotional, intellectual, that can be just for you? I'm curious, Pallavi, what's your one thing that's just for you that you don't share with a partner? Uh, Lots of writing, and I've gotten very into watching French shows. And I know that my partner won't watch them because he doesn't want to read subtitles. (laughs) So it's all mine. (laughs) So that's something that gets to live in your secret garden. I love, look at this road trips, dump journaling, Doug. I love that. Working out, making music, Sebastian, for sure. Learning something new, certain podcasts, Ash. Yes, absolutely. These are all things that get to live in your secret garden. That is a okay. All right, Pavi, what about this next one? So the U.S. Army made me strong. How do I navigate partnership when people find me intimidating? What I really appreciated about this question and to the question asker, thank you for your service. What I really appreciated about this question is it highlights and gets at how our earlier experiences or our bigger life experiences really shape us and they impact us. So this really gets at self-awareness and self-awareness is the foundational trait of emotional fitness. It's about both knowing your biases, your drivers, your desires, your motivators, and knowing how others perceive you. When we know what informs how we show up in the world and how other people experience it, it can give us some very important information about the superpowers that we have and we want to hone, like being strong, and the parts of us that actually aren't serving us anymore. So if we ask ourselves, well, what are my superpowers? And we start to identify them, then we can move into wondering how do they work for me and serve me really well? And how are some of these superpowers working against me? So go ahead, enter into chat one or two words to describe your superpower. I wanna wanna get a sense from folks that are here right now, what are some superpowers that you say, or you would say you have? Maybe you're really inclusive, you're thoughtful, you are strong like this question asker. Maybe you're really determined, you're hilarious, you're human. Intuition and empathy, being really caring or organized. Consider, oh, y'all, these are, we've got hella superheroes with lots of superpowers in this room right now, which I love to see, but I'm I'm seeing empathetic come up a lot. So I'm gonna use this example of how being empathetic can work super well for us. It can help us stay connected to people that are very important to us, even when there's tension or conflict or something's going on and leaning over or over rotating on a superpower like empathy It can also work against us by resulting in prioritizing the other 
over the self at times, or even being approachable, right? There's, we can recognize how this is my superpower and my superpower, depending on the environment and the person and the space, this might get in my way a little bit. So one of the ways that we can think about this intimidation factor or how is our superpower showing up for us or how is it hindering us is thinking about boundary and vulnerability. This is one of my favorite COA concepts of all time. It's all about sharing enough of ourselves with someone that we invite connection, but not sharing so much that we wake up with an emotional hangover. When I get questions about someone being really strong, really intense, really intimidating, I tend to think about leaning a little tight on the share spectrum. When someone leans a little too tight, they might notice themselves walking away from interactions, feeling disconnected or uninterested. They might feel bored by that interaction or even like kind of annoyed at it, right? I know that I've gotten feedback about intimidation and at first it was pretty annoying to me, but to start to move ourselves closer to boundary vulnerability in our relationships, we can ask ourselves questions like, do I feel like I'm learning something new about myself, about this person, about this dynamic from how I'm sharing and how I'm showing up? Do I feel like I'm earnestly connecting with this person? And if the answer is no, we might want to offer a bit more of ourselves. Same thing if we tend to lean leaky and yes, Doug, vulnerability hangovers, they suck. Emotional hangovers, they do. They're the worst type of hangover. One of the worst types, there's all types. But thinking about, am I going to be disappointed by this person's response and how much I'm sharing? A boundary and vulnerability response. So to give you all an example, let's say, a date or a partner shares with us that they have a really big bucket list, right? A too tight response might sound like, oh, cool, I have one too. Cool, neat. Like, what else are you telling me? Whereas a boundary vulnerability response might sound like, oh, dang, what's one thing on your bucket list? One of mine is to have a puppy party, the kind literally where there's puppies everywhere. I'm not talking about the king community, the kind where there's like puppies everywhere and you get to play with them all the time. And as you can hear, this sort of response, it lets someone learn something else about you. So beyond the fact that you have this awesome superpower where you're really, really strong, you're making space for other parts of yourself. Just out of curiosity, what's something on y'all's bucket list? Let me know in chat, right? We'll practice a little, little boundary vulnerability, a little sharing here, stuff that are on your bucket list. As those are coming in, Pavi, let me know what is this next question. How do you accommodate your partner's love language when it's the opposite of yours? First and foremost, check out these bucket lists, boudoir shoots and farms and traveling and jumping out of planes. Y'all just live your best bucket list life. I love this so much. So I often get questions like this one when partners are worried about incompatibility because they don't love all the same things that their partners love or they don't want those things at the same time. It's okay and actually necessary for there to be some differences between you and your partner. It's even okay for there to be some mild tension points between those differences. Tension is a part of all relationships, y'all. In fact, tension is usually the jump off point that gives us a little, little extra push to learn and to grow. One of my favorite concepts that I'm gonna introduce y'all to was first introduced um, by long-term sex and relationship advice columnist, Dan Savage. Shout out to you, Dan Savage. Thank you for honoring us and giving us the idea of what it means to be GGG, which stands for good giving and game. But before I get into that, let's talk about just knowing the flavor. So quick note here about love languages. They are a great starting point, but I would say that they're not the be all end all solution of understanding partners and communicating because they don't account for a lot of nuance and complexity that comes with cultures, identities, fluidity of experience. So just wanna name that. That said, if we use this at a starting place, it is great and worth it to know maybe your initial flavors and your partner's initial flavors that show up. So words of affirmation, receiving gifts, acts of service, quality time, physical touch. These are our starting points. 
And these can look like a lot of different things, both in like actual communication and also in behavior. Because remember, communication looks like a lot of stuff, not just actually verbalizing something. So words can look like giving someone actual verb, excuse me, excuse me, verbal encouragement. It can look like maybe a random note posted on the door for your honey when they get back home. Time, quality time, this can look like being focused and really present with your partner. Maybe going on a walk without your phones or playing a game or putting together a puzzle, right? <clears throat> Gifts can really look like prioritizing. It can be something really, really small, but really what you're communicating to your partner is a thoughtfulness. And then in terms of touch, this can look like those nonverbals, a tenderness in behavior and action. This can look like playing with your partner's hair. And then acts of service can look like literally saying, hey, I've got it. Or how can I help? So maybe it's doing laundry or returning Amazon orders. All right, let me show you what being good giving in game looks like. So there's your language, there's your partner's language, there is shared language that y'all might have. And then there's like that sweet other space of the yellow that you're seeing here of what it looks like to be GGG. And GGG refers to having an openness and a flexibility to explore with your partner while also owning what's yours. So let me break it down. So good as Dan intended, means being good in bed, or we can look at it as being good in empathy. This means empathetically acquiring the emotional skills that you need to show up for your partner in the way that works for them. So active listening, validating, question asking, all of it takes practice, practice, practice. Being giving. Sometimes you want to be able to give pleasure whether that's physical pleasure or emotional pleasure, without the expectation of immediate return. You want to be able to take pleasure in giving your partner pleasure. And that's where your enjoyment comes from. So if you're showing up for them in their love language, even though it's so different from yours, that's the space where you can be really giving in this way, right? Ultimately, it's about not keeping score. And then being game. This means being up for anything within reason. Let me say it again, within reason. So whether we're talking about a sex act or an emotional experience, if it makes you uncomfortable, if it causes pain, if it invites any physical, mental, emotional damage, game does not apply here. You don't have to do things you don't wanna do in order to be GGG. What being game means is finding something that you can do for your partner that while it might not be your thing, they would be super into it. And so your game to try, this can look like writing, playing games, cooking dinner. The possibilities are endless, even if it's not your thing directly. All right, let's keep moving here. Oh man, this one's real. <laughs> Why do we have the same arguments over and over? Y'all, plus one in chat, if you and your sweetheart tend to fight about the same stuff, but like a slightly different version again and again, and you're like, yep, this is, this is our argument. <laughs> this is it. I've seen Amelia giving me an LOL here. I like it. Yes, Laura and Trista for sure. So I mentioned toaster fights a moment ago. Let me talk about what I mean when I say toaster fight. Getting into the same predicament over and over again, it typically happens when something isn't truly getting communicated. If something continues to be left unsaid, but not unfelt, it will find ways up and out until it is actually communicated and fully processed. A good sign of this is a toaster fight. So imagine, you know, that lovely, chill Sunday morning, your boo tries to do something nice for you and makes, you know, the two of you breakfast, but burns your toast. And next thing you know, you're yelling and you're screaming about the burnt toast and it's going nuts. But inside, we all know it has nothing to do in toast. If you know what I'm talking about, let me know in chat, right? There's lots of different versions of this <laughs> or the crumbs. Yes, this is a toaster fight. So really 
where this shows up and having these arguments again and again, in the world of psychology, there's a really important distinction between what we call content and what we call process. Oftentimes when it comes to arguments, we get real caught up in the content, y'all. We want them to see our side. In other words, we want to be right. And we get so attached to being right that sometimes we miss the bigger picture of what is actually going on between us and our loved ones, right? So in content, we're really trying to identify facts. Whereas with process, we're really trying to recognize the dynamic, like what is actually going on here? So staying in the content, it sounds a lot like you did, you said, right? So starting with a you, what someone did or didn't do, what someone did or didn't say, when something did or didn't happen, and getting into the process sounds a lot more like I'm wondering or I'm noticing, right? I'm noticing that I'm responding or feeling this type of way, or I'm wondering what you're noticing or how you're feeling right now right? These are just a few examples of how to start to differentiate between when I'm in content versus how to move myself over to process, right? So if we're stuck on the thing that someone did, can we move ourselves toward how that person felt about themselves before or after the thing, or how we felt about ourselves before or after the thing? Right. So rather than yelling at our sweetheart for forgetting to take the garbage out again, maybe we're moving into, oh, is there shame here for them about having to be reminded to take the garbage out again? And starting with a, hey, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what feeling is here for you. Right. Or the nitty gritty of what someone said. Right. Maybe we get into the process of, what this person said, what is it really reminding me of, right? So, huh, you know, I'm noticing that something that you said just now or <clears throat> last week, it really reminded me of like when I used to get scolded when I was a kid. And that's what's actually there for me. That's the process. This last example here is maybe we're trying to nail down a day, a date, a timestamp of some sort of infraction that our partner engaged in versus tuning into how each of us responded to an uncomfortable moment. A disagreement usually is an uncomfortable moment. So we get into the process of, oh, I notice when something happens, I tend to shut down or withdraw, or I tend to get really big and really loud because I'm feeling unheard. Staying in the content starts with the use while getting into the process starts with the us, the I'm noticing. All right, let's keep it going because we've got a whole theme of questions related to disagreement. Okay, I procrastinated telling my partner things that are fairly timely because I'm worried about what will happen if we disagree. How can I step toward disagreement instead of away from it? Oof, yeah, so talk about some discomfort with disagreement, those two. They tend to go hand in hand. So there's a very big myth that I want to debunk for all of you real quick. Y'all ready? Ears are open. We're leaning in. We're paying attention. Y'all, there is nothing that we can do to prevent tension in a relationship. We are going to disappoint others and they are going to disappoint us. In fact, part of maintaining a healthy relationship is knowing that that's going to happen and accepting that there are going to be moments of what we call rupture, right? Like a breaking heart, something ruptured, and then being able to find repair on the other side of it. And what this looks like is noticing what got stirred by the rupture, tuning into the disappointment instead of tuning out from it and speaking to the experience. So in seeing what it stirs, keeping your eyes and ears peeled for what I call the undertones of your partner's reaction. So you might hear something else aside from disappointment, like grief or loneliness or confusion, or shoot, maybe even relief somewhere. When we keep ourselves tuned in to what else might be there, there's a lot that we can learn. So this goes into that second, excuse me, that second part here of actually tuning into our partner's disappointment. 
and validating that as their experience. We can do this with disappointment, with anger, with fear, with confusion. We can do this with the whole range of emotional experience. This means recognizing and naming that it's happening rather than ignoring it or trying to tune it out. Because like I said, it's uncomfortable to know that we've let our partners down or that they worry that there's a disconnection because we're disagreeing. So saying, I hear how disappointed you are and that it makes sense, right? Something can make sense as an emotional experience and you can maybe not be on the same page all at the same time. So the third is to speak to the impact that you know this is having. When it comes to repair and restoring connection in our partnerships, the intention behind what you said or did far less important than acknowledging that regardless of your intention, there was an impact. When we disagree, it does have an impact on us and our partners. And so being able to speak to that experience is really, really important. And I want to say, yes, making space for repair is important. And it's just as important as knowing what is in and not in your control. So this is what we call understanding your realm of agency and in disagreement with our partners, their feels, their experiences, their thoughts, their questions. These are things that are theirs. They get to own that. That's for them. That's outside of your realm of agency. And you might worry about these things outside of your realm, but no matter how much you worry about it, it doesn't bring it within, to, within your control, right? So things like getting a dupe over or turning back time or making sure someone does or doesn't feel some type of way, that is outside of your realm. So we want to think about what is inside your realm. And we can only think about that when we accept that, y'all, we don't have agency or control over, over other people's experience. So trusting yourself to create space for those experiences and empathizing while still honoring what is within your realm of agency becomes super important, right? What is within your realm? And ultimately, y'all, at the end of the day, you're a human, not a jar of Nutella, right? So grief and disappointment and being bummed out there's nothing you might be able to do to make them less upset when you disagree. That is a-okay. Ash, yes, we are juggling many realities and ultimately making space for multiple truths. Uh, now I want Nutella. But anyway, <laughs> how do we keep discussions from getting too heated when both sides disagree? So to start, we have to notice the ways in which we're getting fired up. It's easy to feel like we're going from zero to a hundred, but if we slow down, we notice there are definitely pit stops along the way. So here are some examples of what this can look like, right? So maybe we're just getting heated up and we want to talk about it, but we don't really know what to say. So mm, I don't know here. And then somewhere in the middle, maybe we're just like our listening skills pff, out the door because we're getting too hot or we're trying to take the edge off or we end up, and I'm seeing that it's cut off there, we end up imploding, meaning we're going inward or exploding and we're going outward. So slowing down to notice your signs and notice your tells, you have to know that you're heating up in the first place. That being said, let's talk about why we get hot in the first place, why we heat up in this way and what we can do. So when something really important to us, like our feeling of safety, or knowing that we're a good partner. When that starts to get threatened, we are very quick to throw our gloves on and defend. And one of the hardest parts of disagreement is that it sends our defenses into overdrive. I don't know if any of y'all have thought to yourselves in the midst of an argument, how dare you think differently from me? Or how can you feel differently about this? Or I'm gonna end this fight before they can reject me. Nope, done, goodbye, hang up the phone, right? And ultimately, curiosity is the best offense that we have to an emotional defense. Other thing about our defenses is while they may have served us really well when they first got established years and years and years ago, 
in the present moment, they might get in our way a lot more than we realized. And so when our defenses are going up and getting in our way, that is when we can start to get curious. And ultimately curiosity is what allows us to challenge our defenses, to put the gloves down in order to receive something instead. It's very hard to receive anything with a closed fist. How do we get curious? Well, we can start by asking some questions. Here are some examples of questions that we can ask our partners the next time disagreement or argument comes up. So we can ask them, you know, what do you think I missed when you were sharing? Just now when you were talking, what did I, what did I miss? What went over my head? Or why does blank fill in the blank? Why does blank feel important to you? And notice my tone when I ask that question. So it's not very accusatory of like, well, why does this feel important to you? I don't get it. It's no, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Help me understand why does this thing feel really important to you? Or when did you first notice something off? How can I respond differently next time? Not only does this allow us to continue our own journey of personal growth, that growth, it ultimately allows us to shake loose from the grip that negative emotions tend to grab hold of during or even after an argument. How do you create a safe environment where your partner can speak their mind with sincerity and honesty? I got a couple different versions of this question, which I appreciate. So shout out to y'all who are wondering how to invite your partners in to share. So being in an ongoing or a long-term partnership Right? It means creating space for the reality that our desires, our needs, our hopes, our dreams, our turn-ons, our turns-offs, all of those things, they evolve over time. And so when we get curious, building off that curiosity I was just talking about, we're much better at changing, adapting, and recalibrating to the partnership that we're in. And while, you know, answering that last question, we talked about questions that we can ask our partners we can play a different version of this with what I call today I learned. So intentionally creating space to continue learning about each other, that's what can invite safety that a partner might need in order to share. So something I wanna invite y'all to try is to play a little today I learned. So over the course of five days, see if you can name one thing that you've learned about your partner by getting curious and asking some questions. So questions like, you know, I noticed we haven't done X, Y, Z in a while, right? We haven't, I don't know if your date night is bowling, right? Good on you, maybe that's your date night. If we haven't done bowling in a while, are you, are you still into it, right? Maybe that's something for them that has shifted and we need to recalibrate. Or what would make date night even 10% better? Or what might I be missing when it comes to your likes and your dislikes? Or even bottom left corner, y'all, even talking about your sex life. Next time we're in bed, what could I do differently? And getting curious in this way to learn one new thing. This is also a great opportunity to invite your partner to get curious about you and learn one new thing about you in these moments as well. This is a great one. How do I ask the hard questions without feeling anxious about the answer? More often than not, y'all, when we are moving away from tough questions, it's because we're worried about some flavor of re rejection. And if we resist the reality that those crappy moments of rejection happen, we can actually become paralyzed in such a way that we can't bring ourselves to take the small risks here and there that we need to take to stay in active partnership. Fear of rejection, it can keep us really rigid. And rigidity, very quickly, it sucks the creativity, the spontaneity, the zest for life and relationship right out of us. It can also keep us from getting curious right? Which is that major trait of emotional fitness that we need in communication with our partners. And what's more, maintaining that fear, it can actually keep us from playing. And play is another very important trait of emotional fitness. When we stop playing, y'all, we stop growing. If you think about the demographic that's growing most rapidly and the demographic that's playing the most, it's kids. 
right? Children are both playing a lot and growing a lot all at once. So we want to give ourselves the opportunity to do that. Taking in the answers to tough questions, it's a very vulnerable thing to do. It can be really emotionally exposing. So checking in with yourself to ask, do I feel vulnerable by asking this tough question and wanting to hear the answer? So during these moments of vulnerabilities, we can check in with ourselves to make sure that we are feeling heard, seen, and understood. Even though we're the ones asking the tough questions and receiving the answers, just because you're on the receiving end doesn't mean that your need to feel heard, seen, and understood goes out the window. So making sure our partners are in a space to listen, are in a space to notice, are in a space to even validate our experience. These become really important. I talked earlier about questions that we can ask our partners. I want to invite y'all to start to think about questions you can ask yourself when it comes to engaging in these tough conversations. So what is my partner saying that I was missing? Where did I learn this behavior from? Why does blank feel important to me? Or when did I respond to a defense? How do I want to show up differently next time? These are things that we can ask ourselves. All right, let's keep it moving here because I want to get to a couple of your questions. Okay. How can I find balance between being authentic to myself and compromising for my partner? Y'all, being in partnership, it means making room for someone other than you to exist in your universe. And that is hard to do because we are all used to being the center of our own universe. Ultimately, we find this balance through my favorite B word of all time, boundaries. So before we talk about how to set them up, just real quick, I want to clarify what boundaries are and what they aren't. Boundaries are healthy, they're adjustable, and they are person and place specific. Boundaries are never a means of punishment. They are not a means of alienation, and they're not one size fits all. So this is equal parts self-awareness, empathy, and effective communication skills. Something we can learn from the kink and BDSM communities is what a non-shaming negotiation conversation looks like. Negotiation conversations, they're ultimately something that all parties engage in in order to best understand each other's boundaries and what they need so we can all have safe, fun relationships. And this can be done for all sorts of experiences not just sexual. So for example, you might go through various acts of physical intimacy, or you might go through various topics of conversation that are typically taboo, right? And get a sense of where each other's at. So politics, money, family history, things like this. We can also do this for parts of ourselves, thinking about our own spiritual practice, our hobbies, our interests. What are we down to share, to talk about? And what are we like, mm, nope, that's a hard no for me. I don't want to share that with you. So while I don't exactly need my partner to go to temple or synagogue, it would be an important negotiation conversation to know where they stand when it comes to lighting Hanukkah candles this time of year, right? So that's a negotiation conversation where I want to know that they're at least open to something like that because that's important to me and my authentic self. So shoot, you can even do this for something seemingly benign, like watching TVs, right? Some nights I do not want to compromise and okay, whatever they want to watch, they can go for it. And that's okay. That said, we might practice our best boundary skills and negotiation conversations. And sometimes our puzzle pieces aren't always going to match up with our sweethearts. Does this mean the relationship is doomed? No, not at all. It's always okay to not have all the chemistry on all of the things and all of the factors or have to compromise, right? I love me some musical theater. Trust that I'm partnered with someone who doesn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. That's okay. That's their loss. So musical theater, that's something that lives in my secret garden, right? So we can give ourselves a little more flexibility in staying authentic and compromising when we're having these conversations. So these takeaways here, I'm not even going to go through it. You're going to get this in your follow-up emails as well as more resources. Pallavi, I know there were some questions that came through. What do you got for me? Well, I am looking at time. So I've chosen two really good ones to give right. you. You've been talking a lot about how we can challenge ourselves to share if we're maybe uncomfortable or if we're afraid. 
But I got a really great question around what happens if that's your partner? How do you draw out somebody who's maybe shut down or ignoring you in the middle of a conflict? Hmm. I like the key factor here in this question, Asker. Thank you for this one. That is in the middle of a conflict. So in the middle of any conflict or any disagreement, we are always allowed to call a timeout. And that might mean if your partner is getting big and loud, it also might mean if you're noticing that your partner is shut down. When we shut down, it means we don't have the resources to stay online. This is something that happens biologically in ourselves, right? Like our frontal lobe, our prefrontal cortex that does all of our thinking for us, it goes offline. And when it goes offline and we go back into our, in, um, our lower brain, our lizard brain, we go into survival mode. And so for some people that can look like withdrawing and shutting down. So if you're noticing it, it might be a great time for a timeout. Now, why I like the timeout and doing a TO analogy is because in any sport, timeout does not mean the game is over. It means going back to your respective sides. It means taking some space so you can recoup so you can game plan and then coming back together. So with your partner to invite more space for them to be able to show up, it's important to let them know that they can actually have space to step away as well. So thinking about timeouts might be a good space to be in. I think that's helpful because a lot of us maybe want to keep pushing and draw yes. them out, but I think allowing the space will eventually let them come to us. 100%. Um, and then there's another really great question around, we've had past relationships, we've had issues with those. How do we not let that residue affect the relationships that we're in now? Oof, yes. This is one that takes time and also boatloads of practice, y'all. So I cannot like speak enough to how much intentional practice this takes. This is why we call working on our mental health emotional fitness at COA. It is not meant to be like a one and done. We figured out it is meant to be proactive and ongoing and a regular part of our practice. So in this sense, having a regular self-reflection practice like journaling or mindfulness or therapy where you can reflect on, oh, I just kind of got into it with this person that I love and care about. Is this about this person or is this coming from somewhere else? And giving yourself the opportunity to slow down just enough to start to recognize what story is this actually coming from? And we can, when we can recognize that our response and our reaction is based in something old, that's where we can actually start to challenge it. So essentially questioning the story and asking ourselves, is what I'm jumping back to, is this true right here, right now of my partnership? Or is this something that, yes, I experience and I don't want to ignore it. So I want to recognize it's here and I can start to differentiate that this old experience is different from my current experience. All right, y'all. I know there are probably plenty more questions out there. So I have very, very good news for you all. If you want to dive deeper into some of this, we have hella classes available to you. And a big one that is coming up that I am leading is our two week series specifically for romantic partnerships. So if you are excited by that, Palvi, will you drop the link into chat for folks? Check out this series and for being here in this Q&A with me today, you get a discount code. You can use the discount code communication for 15% off. So there is that link that's specific to the two week romantic relationship series and using that communication code for 15% off, but you can use that code for any series or any class that's coming up. One other thing, two more things I wanna do here before we wrap up, got two more items. The first, I wanna hear from you all. I wanna get a sense of how was class for you? what do you think about it? What do you want more of? What do you want less of? So I'm gonna drop a quick feedback survey into the chat here. Palvi dropped it in. I'm going to double it. Oh, I'm so glad Tia and Joanna, thank you for being here. Here's that feedback survey. Let me play some tunes. We'll take like 60 seconds or so here before we wrap it all up and we go to our last item of the night. So let's take a little bit time of time with feedback here. Go for it.
Maureen, I see you. If you're having trouble with that link right now, you will also get one in your follow-up email that's gonna have all those resources and that takeaway. So you can click the link that'll be in your email in case, in case you can't get it now. All right, y'all, if you need more time with that feedback, please do take it. But let me know here in chat, one word, how are you feeling now? Let's get a resting heart rate, All right? We got an actual pulse check. We got a feeling pulse check down in here. Go ahead and drop that one word into chat. Where are you at? Locate yourself. And let's see how we're feeling. Feeling enlightened, Amelia, I love it. Informed and educated validated, improved, wholesome, Sebastian. Y'all, I'm feeling excited. I can't wait to see y'all in the series that we have coming up. So hopefully I get to see you very soon. Thank you for being here, for showing up, even to do some of this work right here, right now. It is a big deal. Amber, no worries. You're allowed to be crappy. That is a-okay. Hopefully I get to see y'all in the future. Have a fabulous rest of your days, rest of your nights. And we'll see y'all next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.